Good morning, everybody, and happy Labor Day weekend. It's so good to have everybody a part of the Bay Shore experience today, and we're so excited that you're here. And how about, do you believe it's Labor Day already? I cannot believe it's Labor Day already. It just seems like the summer just went just like that. It's been a weird summer. Let's face it, it's been a little weird, a little strange, but hey, listen, it's been still a great summer, and I hope you've enjoyed your summer. And now we're coming into some really, really great weather, uh, the Indian summer, some great uh, great weather. So anyhow, I hope you're enjoying your Labor Day weekend. Maybe you're listening on the beach today, or maybe you're listening at home, or maybe you were at our Fenwick Island campus, or you're here at Millsboro. Wherever you are, we're so so glad that you've joined us this uh, weekend for Labor Day weekend as we finish our series called Pitfalls. I was thinking a little bit about this summer and uh, how fast it's gone, but also just how different it's been with everybody wearing masks and everybody's got sort of a different view of wearing masks and uh, everybody's starting to get really creative about the kind of mask that you're wearing. Uh, I saw this picture of this lady on this bus and she actually made her mask out of a uh, bottle and put it on top of her head. So, hey, listen, we're getting really wild with this mask thing. I don't know what you're doing with yours. But I, I read a church sign. Somebody sent me this church sign of a church, Assembly God Church, that put on the front of their uh, sign, I want to be like Saul of Tarsus. I want to be on the road to Damascus. To Damascus. Did you get that? Now, if you didn't get that, explain it to the person. Uh, somebody next to you maybe can explain it to you. But anyhow, uh, I hope you're you know putting up with a mask and all that. And I want to say a big thank you to everybody of all of our campuses that are coming to Millsboro, Fenwick Island, and Rehoboth. Everybody's just diligently wearing their mask and been so good about that. And we know it's something we don't want to do, but uh, we're just so grateful for you. And I want to thank you for that. People that are loving Jesus, coming back to church, our regathering uh, services are going so well. People are, uh, each campus, uh, the, the attendance is growing and people are coming back and people putting the mask on and all that. So we just really appreciate uh, your commitment to Jesus to even wear a mask to come to church. But anyhow, I just wanted to give a big shout out to those people. Well, listen, I wanted to uh, finish up this series today called Pitfalls. And I wanted to talk about a common pitfall today. And we're going to talk today about intimidation intimidation when you feel intimidated uh, that's a pitfall that a lot of people fall into and uh, we want to talk about it today and to do that I want to go to a scripture uh, in the Old Testament numbers 13 uh, verses 31 through 33 just want to read a little bit of this uh, of this text here and this text is about the children of Israel coming to the promised land they get right up to the promised land ready to go in and then they find out there's giants in the promised land and they get intimidated and they back off and don't realize their destiny or don't realize their potential. Hey, listen, God wants you and he wants me to realize our potential, our full potential, and reach our full destiny. And the children of Israel didn't reach their full destiny or their full potential because of intimidation. So we've got to overcome intimidation. But here's just a little bit of the story. You know the story. Uh, they sent spies in to the land. Uh, Moses did, and they looked at the land. They found these enormous grapes and this all these wonderful uh, vegetables and fruits there, and they were just bunker uh, bunker crop of all kinds of uh, goods in the promised land. But there were giants also, and so wherever you find opportunities, you always find obstacles. Opportunities and obstacles always go together. So we've got to learn to not let the obstacles intimidate us so that we can seize the opportunities that are in front of us. But let me read the story to you, and then we'll get into this a little bit. Numbers 13, verses 31 through 33. But when the men had gone up uh, with him, and he, they said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they are, then they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw there of, are of great size. We saw the Nephilim. There, the descendants of Anak that came from the, from the Nephilim. And we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. Hey, what an interesting story, you know. We, we have to overcome 
intimidation. And these uh, Israelites, you know, God had this great plan for them, but they were intimidated by the size of the giants and the fortified cities that were in the land of Canaan. And they were very, very afraid and intimidated. Now, it reminds me of a great New Testament scripture that I want us to read. This is a great scripture. You probably heard this scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says this, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, or the word timid there could be fearful or a coward. The spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So if we, have t- if we feel intimidated inside, if we feel fearful inside, if we feel apprehensive about seizing the destiny God has for us, that feeling did not come from God. That did not come from God because that's what it says in uh, first, or 2 Timothy chapter 1, 7. The, the, the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear. So basically, Paul is writing to Timothy, if you're wrestling, and evidently Timothy was timid and he was wrestling with some fear issues. And, and Paul writes to, to Timothy and he says, God did not give us a spirit of fear. So if you have a spirit of fear, that didn't come from the Lord. If you feel intimidated, that didn't come from the Lord. The other day I went to the mailbox and to get the mail at our house and uh, walked out to the road and uh, stack a mail in the, in the mailbox there and uh, I grabbed a hold of the mail and I, I walked it up to the house and I was walking down the sidewalk and I was walking up on to the uh, deck in the front of our house and I was looking at the mail and all of a sudden I recognized a letter there that was not addressed to us. It was my neighbor. It was a letter that was not intended to go to our mailbox. And so I had to turn around and I walked back down the driveway, down the road a little bit and took that letter to uh, my neighbor's mailbox. And listen, when you think about fear or intimidation, that's not, that doesn't have your address on it. That's not something that God gave you. That's something that the enemy gave you. And so you've got to learn and I have to learn to overcome intimidation. And we can feel intimidated by a lot of things. We can feel intimidated by opportunities that are in front of us. Uh, maybe there's something that we've always dreamed about doing, but we get all kind of tied up in the, uh, in, in the fear and the intimidation. Or maybe you can even be fearful of people. That's a really common thing that people wrestle with, fear of people. They're afraid of people. They're intimidated by certain people. If there's somebody that's rich around them, they're intimidated by rich people. If there's somebody that's very fit and in shape, they feel intimidated by that person. Or if there's somebody highly educated, they feel intimidated by that person. Uh, And so we can have all kinds of intimidation that we can feel toward people. And you know what Eleanor Roosevelt said? Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. So if you're feeling inferior, you've consented, you've agreed to let that feeling come in because God didn't give it to you. You've taken that into your own heart and you are letting the situation make you feel uh, intimidated and fearful. Now, it's interesting in the story, when you read the story of the 12 spies going in, to the land of Canaan. Of course, you have two guys, you know, Joshua and Caleb, that, that are full of faith and, and they see the opportunity and they're not ruled by fear, they're ruled by faith. But then you've got the 10 that are ruled by fear and they're ruled by the giant, the size of the giants and all that. And here's what they said about themselves they said, We're like grasshoppers in the eyes of these giants. Uh, and they saw themselves as grasshoppers. And here's the assumption. How they saw themselves is how they thought the giants saw them. Now, it says, and, then, and it says, we look the same to them. In other words, they said the giants, when the giants look at us, they think of us as being grasshoppers. Now, how do they know that? How do they know that the giants are thinking, those Israelites are a bunch of grasshoppers? They don't know what the giants are thinking, but they're projecting their image of themselves onto the giants, that the giants are thinking that. So it's important for us to remember this, that sometimes, you know, we're projecting how we feel about ourselves onto other people, and we think that those people feel about us the same way we feel about ourselves. So if we feel small, 
if we feel insecure, if we don't respect ourselves, then other people, as they look at us, they're going to look at us and we're going to think that they think that we aren't very successful and that we're not smart or whatever. And so we project onto other people what we think we think about ourselves. And we assume that those people think the same thing. Hey, listen, let me set you free right now. This is wonderful, wonderful news. This is a great, great truth here. You and I cannot read other people's minds. Do you know that? We think we know what people are thinking. We think we know what they think about us. And so we assume that we know how they see us. And these these 10 spies, they said, oh my gosh, they look at us and they think we're grasshoppers. And they don't really know at all what these people think, but they're projecting their thoughts onto other people. I can't, I'll never forget years ago, when I first started pastoring here at Bayshore, there was a, a young uh, couple in our church. They were, they, were, they were like Ken and Barbie. They were handsome. Uh, you know, she was beautiful. Uh, he was handsome. He was athletic. Uh, they were rich. They were very, very successful. Uh, and, uh, and just, I'm telling you, this, this couple, they just turned heads when people came in, when they came in the, in the church building. And they had incredible success. They had a big home, uh, great amount of income. Uh, and as I mentioned, they were very, very handsome and very, very beautiful people. And one day the, uh, the, the gentleman made an appointment to see me. And I'm thinking, what's he going to talk to me about? I have no idea. I, you know, they've been in the church for a while and they sit out there and they're just these, these perfect people with great amount of money, looks, the whole package. And I'm thinking, you know, I have no idea what they're coming to talk to me about. So the guy comes in, I think it, his wife came with him, but it was mainly the guy's appointment. And he said, Pastor Danny, I want to talk to you and I need some counseling. And he said, I want you to help me because I feel incredibly insecure. I feel incredibly insecure. I feel like a failure. I feel like uh, my self-esteem is on the bottom of the, f- of the floor. He said, I just feel like incredible failure. And you could have knocked me over with a feather because I would never suspect that that guy felt inferior you know, and he felt like an insect. He felt like a grasshopper. And he assumed everybody around him thought the same thing about him. And that's, that's absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. Listen, you cannot read other people's minds. And if you have a poor opinion of yourself, you're going to assume that those people have a poor opinion of you as well. And so it says in the text that, that uh, you know, we're like grasshoppers and we look like grasshoppers. The giants think we're grasshoppers as well. So you got to remember that. you got to remember that, that how you feel about yourself and how you see yourself is not necessarily how other people see you. And it's also not necessarily for sure how God sees you. So you can have a completely wrong view of yourself. And I'll never forget sitting there with that wonderful couple. And here's this handsome guy, square jaw, uh, you know, just a handsome guy. And they drove up on, in, their M, in their BMW. I mean, they just really had everything. But yet he felt like a failure. So we got we to make sure that we learn to deal with inferiority and a feeling of being intimidated by other people. And so when you think about this story, what you see in this story is that you see, you see uh, these Israelites come in and they see these people, these other people that are big, they're, they're huge, they're, they're giants. And sometimes when we're around people, we think that they're so much more significant than we are. We feel insignificant, but they feel, uh, well, we think that they are significant. So a giant is someone of significant size and a grasshopper is insignificant size. So they compared themselves with those people and they were intimidated by those giants and they felt like that those people were significant, but they were insignificant. Let me tell you something. You are significant in the hands of, in the eyes of God. God loves you. God cares about you. God cares about me. He cares about you. You are made in his image. There's nobody else like you in the whole universe. So you've got to be able to lean into that 
and accept the fact of how much God loves you and cares about you. This young guy that came in, the handsome, rich young guy that came in for counseling, I just had to minister to him over several sessions to talk to him about how he was seeing himself and to put himself in the context of how much God cared about him and how much God loved him. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the fear of man is a snare. It says that in, in Proverbs. Proverbs, Proverbs, it's Proverbs, uh, let me find it here. Proverbs 29, 25, fear of man will prove to be a snare. Now, the word snare there is to put a hook in somebody's nose and to control them. People that are afraid of people and are intimidated by their people are controlled by that inferiority. They're controlled by it, and it's ruling over them all the time. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. So here's, here's something to think about. When you are fearful of other people, when you're intimidated by other people, when you feel other people are significant, they're smart, they're rich, they're fit, they're, they're big, they're significant, and you feel insignificant, and you're operating in the fear of man, when you're in the fear of man, it's a snare to you. It holds you back. You think about a trap. This word snare there can be like a hook in the nose to control an animal. It also can be a snare if, a, if an animal or a deer is running through the, the woods and gets its, its foot caught in a snare. That snare holds the deer from being able to move forward. And so when you think about fear of man, if you're afraid of people, if you're fearful of people, then you've got to remember that that fear didn't come from God. God did not give you a spirit of intimidation. God did not give you a spirit of fear, but God gave you a sound mind. He gave you power uh, and he gave you confidence. You know, by the way, back to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the, the, uh, the, the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. Power. You know what that word means? The word power means it's the word dunamis in the Greek. It's a word we get dynamite from. And uh, we tend to think of that word as sort of like, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, power and like an evangelist or like this powerful wind or whatever. But it really means competence. It means divine ability that God gives you competence. He gives you the ability to do what you are doing and what he's called you to do. If God's called you to lead an office, God has given you the, the power, the competency, the ability to do that. So you have been endowed by God with what you need for that task. I remember when I came here to be a pastor, you know, 40 some years ago, I had three sermons, you know, three sermons. And I thought, oh my gosh, I preached them all in the first week I was there, you know, a Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday night. And not, like I was like on my own. I had to figure that out. But, you know, God gave me the ability. He gave me the, the competence to do that. Now, you may be taking over a new law office or you may be taking over a new business. You may be taking, maybe you're a mother for the first time. You brought this little baby home and you bring it home and you think, oh my gosh, I, I, don't, I can't do this. I don't have the ability to do this. And you're filled with fear. You're filled with apprehension. And you don't know how you're going to do this. Hey, listen, God has not given you a spirit of intimidation, a spirit of cowardice, like, I can't do this. I got to run from it. But God's giving you a spirit of power power. He's given you the ability, the competency to do that. So just say this with me. I am competent to do whatever God's called me to do. So just remember that God has not given you a spirit of fear. He's not given you a spirit of intimidation. If you're intimidated by where you are right now, that is not God in your life. That's something else. And don't submit to that attitude. But the, the Bible says the fear of man is a snare. So whenever you let yourself be intimidated by people and fearful of people, then you are going to be held back. It's a snare. It holds you back from becoming everything that you are meant to become. And listen, I just want to say to you on this, uh, on, on this uh, message today, God has big plans for you. God has incredible things for you. God has great things for your future. And just like the children of Israel, they were supposed to take over that land. They were supposed to take those walled cities. They were supposed to get all that fruit. God had great things for them, but their intimidation kept them from realizing that. So you got to remember that. Now, here's, here's a couple little things about uh, fear of man. If you are a person that's ruled by fear of man, fear of people, Here's a couple characteristics. First of all, you tend to agree with people about everything. 
You, can, you tend to agree with people about everything. You're in a group and, and you don't feel like you, you feel like you're insignificant and they're significant. They're the giants. They're the significant people. You're insignificant. So you don't really express your real opinions. You don't express who you are. Your personality is hid in the closet. As you're trying to figure out what those people want you to do, what they want you to say, and what, they, what, you, what, what you, you think they want you to be. And so you become somebody else because of fear of man. And the world is robbed. The world is robbed of who God made you to be. God made you this unique person. The Bible says in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that full well, the psalmist says. So when you're filled with fear of people, you, you're in a group of people and you're just listening to what everybody's saying and you're just going along with them because you're not expressing who you really are. You're agreeing with them. When Karen and I lived in Florida, uh, we lived in uh, Pensacola, Florida for about three years when we went to school there. And uh, in Pensacola, they were all of these camellia lizards in our backyard. We had these little camellia lizards. And you know those camellia lizards, you know, if, they're, if they get on a brown stick, they turn completely brown. They blend into the stick. If they're on a bright green leaf, they turn green. If they're on a reddish leaf, they turn reddish color. In other words, they adopt to the environment that they're in. Now, a person with fear of people is someone that just sort of goes along with everybody, just agrees with everybody. They, they kind of listen to the con 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 uh, conversation. If they're with a bunch of liberal people, uh, politically, they'll talk liberally. If they're with a bunch of conservative people, they'll pretend they're conservative. If they're with uh, certain people that do this or that, they'll agree with whatever uh, the people are saying because they don't have enough confidence to speak their own mind. The Bible says to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. You can disagree without being disagreeable. You can say, you know, hey, that's interesting, and I sure respect that view, but here's what I think. That's a healthy thing. That's a healthy thing for you to be able to express your own opinion. People that never express their own opinion are people that are sort of ruled by the fear of man. So their real personality, their real views are go underground, and in fact, they just begin to forget who they are. They don't even know who they are anymore because they're trying to please everybody. They're trying to please everybody. Uh, I don't know if you remember the, the movie that came out, I think it was in 1999, uh, The Runaway Bride. Here's a picture of The one, Runaway Bride bride starring uh julia roberts now what's interesting about this movie uh for us locally this movie was filmed in berlin maryland and uh, berlin was named hale i think hale uh, maryland in the movie but it was filmed in berlin and uh, a lot of us have gone to berlin and we walk you know down the streets and we see some of the uh, leftover features of that movie there but in this movie, uh, Julie Roberts played this gal by the name of Maggie Carpenter. And Maggie Carpenter, what, uh, she, she couldn't seem to get married. She'd been engaged like four or five times. And every time she'd get to the altar, she'd take off. And Richard Gere is this uh, newspaper editor from New York City. He comes down. He's writing a story about the whole runaway bride thing. And, of course, they fall in love. That's what happens in these movies. But what's interesting about the movie is that Richard Gere discovers that what's, what's going on with Julie Roberts or her character Maggie Carpenter is that she accommodates herself to all of her fiancés. Uh, if they like their eggs over easy, that's how she likes her eggs. If the next guy likes her, his eggs scrambled, that's how she likes her eggs. And she just goes along with everybody and she becomes what she thinks her fiancés want her to become. And that's, a, that's the rule, that's one of the rules of a fear of man syndrome that you're fearful of what other people uh, are going to think about you if you express your own opinion. And it's important if you're going to overcome the fear of man uh, that you know how to be able to say, hey, here's what I think. And again, you can be disagree without being disagreeable. What an incredible, incredible principle. So a person that's fear of man just goes along with everybody. They kind of uh, wet their finger, see what way the wind is going in the conversation, and they go along with that instead of being themselves. So here, here's another thing that people with fear of uh, man do. People with fear of man have trouble saying no. They can't say no. They do things they don't want to do. They say yes to things they want to say no to. Uh, and I, I used to struggle with this. I remember when I first moved here, I had, uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of friends and I'm trying to, you know, do this ministry thing and I'm trying to survive and I didn't have a lot of friends. And so I found out the best way to, uh, to go to make friends was to play golf. 
And so I bought some golf clubs and, um, and people would invite me out and I would talk about golf like I love golf and I would just talk about it and talk about it. And, uh, you know, and all these people invite me to go golfing and, I, and I'd be real busy and somebody would call me and say, hey, uh, you want to go golfing tomorrow? You know, golf is like, tastes like six hours and it's really expensive. And I said, oh man, I'd love to go golfing. And inside I didn't want to golf at all. And, uh, you know, after about five or six years of that, I realized I hate golf. I hate it. I don't need, I, it's not like I don't like it. I hate it. I don't like to play golf. Now, I think golf is an incredible game. It's an incredible game. If you're a golfer, I have utmost respect for you because it's a very difficult game. And, uh, but I didn't like to golf. And so I was saying yes when I really wanted to say no. And the reason I was saying yes is I didn't want to jeopardize these relationships. And uh, what I should have said is, listen, I love you. And uh, if you ever want to go uh, biking or if you ever want to go play tennis or if you ever want to, you know, go cycling, cycling, I would love to do that. But I love you, but I hate golf. I just don't want to golf. So person that can't, the person that's ruled by fear of man cannot set boundaries. That's an important thing to remember. So think about this. Uh, if you're struggling with intimidation toward other people, remember this principle. Remember this principle. God made you to be who you are. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are God's workmanship uh, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good work. You know what the word workmanship, handiwork, it says in this translation? Handiwork is the word poema in the Greek, and it's a po it means to be a poem. God has made you a particular poem. He's not made you like anybody else. He's made you to be you. He's created you to be you and be yourself. And fear of man will dissolve who you are. Fear of man will cause you to blend in to the crowd when the world desperately needs you to be the original you God made you to be. A very, very important principle there. And you know what I think? I think the, how we get, how we fix this when we have fear of man is we have to get a revelation of how important we are to the Lord. We have to get a revelation of how important we are to the Lord. And uh, sometimes we don't, we don't get that revelation. There's a great story in Luke chapter 19, where uh, Zacchaeus is a rich tax collector, and uh, he's rich, and he's little. He's a short man. We know he's short because he couldn't see Jesus in the parade there, and so he ran ahead in Jericho. He ran ahead, which shows his ambition. So this guy was incredibly ambitious. He was very innovative. He climbed up a tree, so that marked how he was successful. He was ambitious, and he was climbing up a tree. You know, he was innovative. And so Jesus comes to this little man who was a tax collector. And tax collectors, by the way, if you do a little research, they were hated. Everybody hated the tax collectors. He had a lot of money, but he didn't have any friends. And he was lonely. And, uh, and, and he felt so insignificant. Even though he had all that money, he felt like a little, little insignificant person. But the Bible says that Jesus came to that uh, tree that, that he was in. And he looked up and he called him by name. Aren't you glad that God knows your name? He called him by name and he said, Zacchaeus, come down. Today, you and I are going to have lunch. Of all the people in Jericho, of all the people in the parade, of the thousands of people that were there to see Jesus, uh, Jesus sat down with this tax collector who nobody seemed to love, and he poured his love into that man, and he, and he listened to Zacchaeus, and he loved him. And Zacchaeus says, I'm going to give back all the money I've taken from people. I'm going to begin to follow Jesus, and his life was changed. Our lives are changed when we look at how Jesus looks at us, when we look at how Jesus looks at us, Jesus considered Zacchaeus to be incredibly important and incredibly valuable. And Zacchaeus didn't feel very good about himself. But for us to get healed of our insecurities, we have to see ourselves how God sees us. God loves us. And, and Jesus sat down and had lunch with Zacchaeus and they ate, uh, they ate burgers. I think they were at five guys, you know, they're eating burgers and they're talking and, and Jesus is just listening to Zacchaeus and he loves Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus's life was changed. When I was learning to preach, I'm still learning to preach, by the way, to want to be a good communicator. I remember when I, when I first started preaching, I, I, I studied this guy by the name of Fred Craddock. He was a uh, professor of New Testament uh, theology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And I heard a tape of him, and he was the best preacher I ever heard. And I thought, so I listened to everything that he did because I wanted to learn. He was a great storyteller. He was a great communicator. And Fred Craddock, in one of his messages, is told about something that happened to him one time. He said he was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. 
he was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and uh, he and his wife are on vacation, and they're sitting there, uh, you know, with a, at a restaurant where there's a big window. They could see the Smoky Mountains. And he said there's this, this kind of dignified gentleman going from table to table. And Fred Craddock and his wife are on vacation. He's a seminary professor and a preacher and all that. And he's just wanting to get away. And he sees this old man, uh, dignified-looking old man, uh, coming his way. And he thought, oh, my, I hope he doesn't come to our table. But sure enough, he came there. And he said, where are you folks from? And Fred said, well, we're from Oklahoma. And he said, well, what do you do for a living? He said, well, I'm a seminary professor. He said, so you, you teach preachers how to preach? And he said, let me tell you a story. And he pulled up the chair and he pointed out the window. And he said, you see that mountain over there? There was a young boy over in that mountain that uh, when, he was, uh, when he was a little boy, he had a lot of struggles. And the reason he had a lot of struggles is that he was conceived out of wedlock. And in those days, that was a big thing. And his mom and dad weren't married. Nobody really knew who his dad was. And he was in that hills there. And everybody at playground, everybody at down Main Street would always look at him wondering who his daddy was. Wondering who his daddy was. And they would even ask him sometimes, son, who's your daddy? Son, who's your daddy? And he said one day, uh, this little boy, there was a new preacher at the Baptist church in the hills there that uh, he went to. And he would always come in late. This little boy would come in late, leave early because he didn't want anybody to say anything to him. So this little, little boy, he comes in to this, uh, this church and it's crowded. And this big preacher, I mean, he's just really doing so good and he's preaching. And he gets so captivated with this message that he forgot to leave early. And he's trying to get out and the crowd is all around him and he can't get out. And he's starting to panic. He's having a panic attack. Because he's afraid somebody's going to say, son, who's your daddy? And there was the preacher. Preacher put his hand on his shoulder and said, son? He said, son, who is your daddy? And then he realized the little boy was so embarrassed. And he said, wait a minute. Wait a minute, son. I see a striking resemblance. Well, you are. You are a son of God. And he said, he slapped me on the britches. And he said, now go and collect your inheritance. Well, Fred Craddock listened to that old man. The man finally went off. And then the waitress came and he said, ma'am, who was that man? And she said, oh, that's, that's Ben Hooper. Ben Hooper, he was the governor of Tennessee for two terms. You know, when you get a different view of yourself, when you see yourself in a different way, you can accomplish great things. But if you see yourself as a grasshopper, insignificant, and everybody else is big and significant, you're never going to achieve what God wants you to achieve. And God has an incredible plan for you. You are not junk. You are not second rate. I think about, you know, individuals can have an inferior complex. I think uh, different genders, sometimes women feel like they're not as good as men. Uh, different races, we have so many issues about race now that sometimes a race can feel inferior. And let me tell you something, there's no superior or inferior race in God's eyes. Every race is equal in the sight of a loving God. God loves the Italians. God loves the French. God loves the Native Americans. God loves the African Americans. God loves every race. In fact, in our own country, the terrible history of what we've experienced and how there's been mistreatment. Uh, I just think about what happened uh, to, to uh, Jesus as he was on the cross. And, and before he actually went to the cross, when Jesus was on his way to, to go to the cross, the Bible says he was carrying his cross. He was carrying his cross, and as he was carrying his cross, it got too much for him, and he fell time and time again on the, on the road there in Jerusalem. And they seized a man by the name of Cyrene, Simon Cyrene, from, uh, Simon from Cyrene. And Cyrene was, was North Africa. So God ordained from the foundation of the world that when Jesus was in his greatest need, he sent a man from Africa to help carry his cross. There is no inferior race. There is no inferior race. We've been made in the image of God. Would you say it with me? There is no inferior race. God loves every race. He loves every individual. Nobody is a grasshopper. You're not a grasshopper. I'm not a grasshopper. I've been made in the image of God. And you can do more. I remember 
My story is uh, in high school, I was a really poor student. I wasn't a good student. Um, I just wasn't interested in learning. And I got out of high school with a really low GPA and got into life and was working and I was married. And, and all of a sudden I realized, you know, I need to get an education. And of course, God called me into ministry and I went to Bible college and that wasn't really that hard. And then I came back and I felt like I should go to a, a to a, a university school, and so I remember signing up for classes at the University of Delaware, and I remember thinking I was I've been always been a poor student, I've always been not very smart, I've always got C's and D's and F's, and I remember I was just nervous, I was intimidated to go sign up for the classes, and I remember signing up for those classes and walking down that hallway and overcoming my intimidation and going into those classrooms, and the Lord helped me to get. A's and B's all through university studies and then graduate studies. Because you know what you have to do? You have to face, you have to face what you're intimidated by. And when you face what you're intimidated by and you overcome your intimidation, then you and I can become what we are called to be. Hey, listen, I want to pray with you on this Labor Day weekend. Uh, I just, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it strong this morning. I'm feeling that God's saying to some people listening to me right now that you're going to reach a higher potential this year, this new year. The rest of 2020, 2021, 2022, you're moving forward. You're going to go into the land. You're going to kill the giants, and you're going to seize the destiny God has for you. Would you lift up your hands with me as we pray right now? Lord, we want to thank you for blessing us and anointing us today. We thank you that that you have a plan for all of us, and we thank you that we're not grasshoppers, we're not insects, we're not insignificant. We're not insignificant, but we are significant because we have been made in your image. So we pray for your anointing to be with us today as we move forward into a new week. We thank you that we're going to reach further, and we're going to run faster, and we're going to do more than we've ever done before. We thank you for being with us in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Hey, I love you guys. We're starting a brand new series next week called Blink. And can't wait for you to be with us next week. I love you guys. Have a great week.